Hi, my name is Andrew Charters and I am co-partner in a catering business with my oldest friend, Agnes Brown. I first met Agnes when we were both at Nottingham Effie College. I was studying business management whilst Agnes was on a catering course. It so happened that I enjoy cooking myself, so when the catering department offered some weekend courses for students not on their regular program, I signed up. Agnes was one of those helping tutor us newbies. We quickly became good friends. There was never anything physical between Agnes and me, probably because she is a lesbian and I am a mere male. However, that glitch in our respective sexualities didn't stop us becoming firm friends. In addition to our shared love of cooking, we found we have many other interests in common. Our friendship continued through college and after we graduated. Agnes got a job as trainee chef at a rather prestigious restaurant in London, whilst I went off to Edinburgh to join the management information department of a large, Scottish leisure group. The distance between our respective places of work meant that we didn't get to meet up very often, but we were always talking to each other via social media. We always kept across how the other's career was progressing, so I wasn't that surprised when, some six years after graduating, Agnes informed me that she was thinking of setting up on her own. What was a bit of a shock, however, was when she suggested I might like to join her in a partnership. By now I had been promoted a couple of times and held quite an important middle management position. However, I knew that, with the onset of AI, the writing was on the wall for number crunchers like me. Algorithms would soon do my job very much faster. So, I was in a receptive frame of mind when Agnes suggested we meet up for a proper conversation. I traveled down to London for the weekend and went to stay with Agnes in her small flat in Bermondsey. It wasn't a large flat, but Agnes had just split from her last girlfriend, so there was no difficulty in my staying over. Agnes and I have shared a bed on many occasions. Just because we don't fancy each other sexually, doesn't mean we can't enjoy a companionable cuddle. I arrived in Bermondsey late on the Friday evening. Agnes had prepared a scrumptious supper, and we agreed to defer any serious conversation to the following day. There was a lot of gossip to catch up on, so it was quite late before we tumbled into bed. Oh, it's been too long since you and I did this, Agnes sighed, snuggling up under my arm. It is lovely to be able to share warmth and affection without any expectations about performance. We both giggled at this. Although I am straight and have had several semi-serious relationships with women, Agnes is one of the very few people who know I also have a secret fondness for cross-dressing. Occasionally, when we were still at college, Agnes would help me transform into my alter ego, Andrea, and we would go out on the town in Nottingham as a lesbian couple. On the Saturday morning Agnes slid out of bed quite early. I'm off for my run, she announced. You get breakfast ready for us, the makings are all in the kitchen and I'll be back in an hour. Groaning, I rolled over and tried to go back to sleep. However, I knew the attempt would be hopeless. An hour isn't a long time, and I knew Agnes would expect breakfast to be on the table on her return. I crawled out of bed and into the shower. A swift blast of hot water worked wonders, and, by the time Agnes returned, I had orange juice, warm croissants, and coffee ready for us. Over breakfast Agnes outlined the broad shape of her plan. I've been researching opportunities in the marketplace, she started, and I think I have found a slot into which you and I could fit. She then went on to explain that whilst there were many companies who offered in mid to large scale catering functions, there weren't that many who offered to come into a person's home and work on the smaller party plans. She was more than a little excited by the idea. We wouldn't need much capital to set up, she explained. Our equipment, in the main, will exist in people's own kitchens. We would just need to provide any specialist bits and pieces needed for particular menus. What about food and staff? I inquired. Food we only buy once we have agreed the menu, and as for staff, well, for small functions you and I and maybe a couple of others is all we would need. And we can hire in casual staff as and when required. Basically it would just be the two of us. What do you think? Naturally I wasn't going to go overboard on just the idea, so the next few hours were taken up with detailed questions about capitalization, risk and the other 101 details that occurred to me. Agnes had answers for all of them. 
I have to confess all this looks extremely promising, I finally had to admit. I have been giving consideration to my future and had come to the conclusion I need to shift track. Your idea might be just what I need to get me going again. Agnes threw herself into my arms and hugged me. Oh, I'm so glad you like it, she enthused. There is no one else I'd rather work with. We then talked about how we might fund the costs associated with setting up a new business. There would inevitably be a need for marketing and such like. It turned out that both of us had some savings, and I had contacts in the banking world we could approach. By mid-afternoon we had decided to give it a try. So what if it fails? I announced with bravado, we will have had fun getting it up and running. It won't fail, Agnes insisted. With you and I at the helm, this ship is going to float. And so we went for it. I resigned my position with the leisure company and set about establishing our new company. Fortunately this sort of thing came easily to me and, before long, we were the proud owners of at-home catering LTD. I was company secretary and Agnes was CEO. Agnes's instinct proved sound and in the matter of a few months we were confident our company was viable. Order trickled in to start with, but swiftly accelerated as our reputation for excellence spread. After five years of operation, we were firmly established as the go-to place for intimate catering at home. Our projects ranged from special anniversaries for couples, through dinner parties for 8 to 10 people, to larger functions of say 25 small-scale weddings, for example. However, no matter how many inquires we received, Agnes and I never took on more projects than we could personally supervise. One or other of us was always in charge of each and every booking we accepted. One day Agnes came to me in some excitement. You know I went on the London Pride March the other weekend, she started. Well I met this gorgeous woman and we got chatting. Her name is Amanda, and it turns out she's Lady Something or Other. To cut to the chase, Amanda has just rung me and asked if we could cater for a weekend party at her house in Hertfordshire. It is her 40th birthday coming up and she wants to hold a bash for her lesbian friends. No men allowed. Sounds good, I responded. I take it this one you will want to run rather than me. Too right, Agnes giggled, in this instance I think a lesbian project leader will go down better than a male crossdresser. That's unfair, I responded in mock anger, you know I haven't dressed for ages. We are far too busy here. I know, Andy, she responded. But I bet this is a gig Andrea could really get her teeth into. I had to agree. Agnes set about preparing for Amanda's party. It transpired the lady something or other Agnes had so casually referred to meant the Amanda was actually Lady Amanda de Bruin, eldest daughter to the Marquis of Branding. It was in one of her father's houses that Amanda proposed holding her party. Amanda told Agnes to cater for a maximum of 20 guests. I doubt they will all turn up, she explained. My friends tend to be a bit of a flighty crew and can never make their minds up until the last minute. The party was to run from afternoon tea on the Friday until post-breakfast on Sunday. Agnes and the team would go down on the Thursday to get set up. We are staying in the house, Agnes explained. Broccoli Manor is apparently a small Georgian shooting lodge the family don't use that much anymore. Although I guess small in this context is relative. It can sleep more than 20 guests and has a complete servant's floor. That is where we will be staying. As the house isn't used much, the family just keep a housekeeper and her husband, the caretaker, in residence. Amanda tells me the caretaker will be given the weekend off in keeping with the no-men policy and housekeeper has been instructed to hire in two or three local girls to act as maids for the weekend. I'm taking all the cooking and waiting staff with me. Although I generally handle logistics and run front of house on our projects, leaving Agnes to concentrate on the cooking, she is equally able to take over my role. On this occasion she decided to take Molly Johnson, one of our more experienced cooks, to head the team in the kitchen. I know Molly isn't a chef, Agnes told me, but I'm going to be around if she needs to refer anything. It will be good experience for her. The date of the party rolled round and, on the Thursday morning, Agnes set off for Broccoli Manor in her car with half the team, whilst Molly followed in the van with the other two girls and everything they would need for the weekend. In all Agnes took a team of five, plus herself. 
There was Molly, supported by Jean, as second cook, and Gemma as kitchen dog's body. The two waitresses were Sally and Glenna. Apart from the fact that our client had insisted on an all-female team, this gig wasn't that different from many others we had run in the past, so I wasn't anticipating any problems. I was therefore somewhat thrown when, mid-afternoon, the phone rang. It was a highly upset Molly. Oh, Mr. Charters, she wailed, something dreadful has happened. Miss Agnes went off in the car to pick up a few last-minute supplies from the next town and she has been involved in a terrible car accident and is in hospital. What should I do? I thought fast. Don't worry, I reassured her. I'm on my way. I'll go straight to the hospital and see how badly injured Agnes is. You concentrate on getting ready for the party. This is our problem, not our clients. Although I tried to sound calm, inside my stomach was churning. Poor Agnes. What if she really was seriously ill? Still, no point speculating. The sooner I get to the hospital, the sooner I will know the worst. The drive to Hertfordshire, although not that far, seemed to take forever. When I arrived at the hospital, I hurried through to the ward where I learned Agnes had been admitted. Agnes was quite a sight, one arm and one leg were in plaster, and the leg was raised in traction. Her face was scratched and bruised, but, to my great relief, she saw me enter the ward and greeted me warmly. I've really gone and done it this time, she said, trying to grin. A grimace of pain crossed her face. Although, honestly, it wasn't my fault. The other car came shooting out a side road and straight into me, I didn't stand a chance. The nurse has just told me the police have arrested the other driver on a charge of dangerous driving. But how are you? I inquired, anxiously. Rather better than I look, was Agnes' equivocal reply. The breaks in my arm and leg are both clean. They are going to take time to heal, but there is no complication. The rest of my injuries are basically cosmetic. They hurt, but should heal quite swiftly. I was really lucky though, she continued in a serious tone. My car is a total write-off. The fire brigade had to cut me free. But what about Amanda's party? I can't leave poor Molly all on her own. Her voice was rising and I could see she was still in shock. I attempted to soothe her. It's all right, Agnes. I'm here now. I'll go on to the house as soon as I leave here and sort things out with Amanda and Molly. You are going to have to take over control, Agnes insisted, becoming more agitated. You can run this event standing on your head. I know, I said soothingly, but you forget, I am a man and it's a women-only weekend. Well, just become a woman for the duration, Agnes said, crossly. You and I are about the same size. My things are already at the manor, and it won't be the first time you have worn my clothes. But that was years ago, I protested, I haven't tried to pass for ages. I'm not sure I still can. Of course you can, Agnes retorted. You make a lovely woman when you put your mind to it. It's only for a couple of days. Promise me you will ask Amanda. I had to agree with her request, if only to calm her down. Reassured Agnes was in good hands, I said goodbye and returned to my car. When I arrived at Broccoli Manor, it turned out to be a classic, square, late Georgian brick house, set in parkland with formal gardens surrounding the house. Broccoli Manor poor Molly was waiting anxiously for my arrival. She cheered up immeasurably once I was able to assure her that there was nothing too serious wrong with Agnes. Do you know where Lady de Bruin is? I asked. She's in the drawing room. I just took her in some tea, Molly told me. She's really upset about Miss Agnes. I'll go and see her, I said and headed off for the drawing room. Lady Amanda rose to greet me. Her great beauty immediately struck me. I knew she was going to be forty in a couple of days' time, but you would never have guessed it. She didn't look a day over thirty. Tall and slim, her blonde hair was swept up in a French pleat. She crossed over to me. And how is Agnes? I've been so worried. I explained, once again, that although the crash had been a serious one, Agnes had got off extremely lightly. She'll be out of action for at least a couple of months, I told Amanda, but an enforced rest will do her good. 
Agnes is a dreadful workaholic. Now about your party, I continued. Oh, let's not worry about that. I can easily get some party food delivered from Marks and Spencer, Amanda interjected. It's all in hand, I told her. Agnes is adamant that your party must go ahead as planned. She has insisted I take her place. It's okay, I said, seeing a puzzled frown cross Amanda's face. I know this is a woman-only weekend, but Agnes has insisted I confide in you. I'm a cross-dresser, only an intermittent one these days, I'm afraid, but I used to be very convincing, or at least that is what Agnes says. She and I used to go out pretending to be a lesbian couple when we were at college. Amanda giggled. Now that you mention it, I can see a feminine cast in your features. What you are proposing wouldn't worry me, but one or two of my friends are extremely anti-men. You might come in for a rough time if you are caught out. I'm willing to risk that if you are, I told her. It's what Agnes wants, and I've found, over the years, what Agnes wants, she usually gets. We both laughed. Let's go for it. Amanda squealed, clapping her hands. Even if you are found out, it will prove an amusing divertisement for the party. Do you have everything you will need, though? Agnes' work clothes are in her room upstairs, I explained. She and I are roughly the same size, so I can probably squeeze into those. My hair is going to be an issue, though, as I don't have a wig. I can help there, Amanda said, delighted to be able to contribute. There is an old nursery on the servant's floor. It's stuffed with old costumes and things. I'm sure you will find a wig in there. Take anything you think will help in your disguise. I'll come with you and show you the way. We went upstairs three flights to the servants' quarters. Amanda showed me the room used by Agnes. Agnes' suitcase was open on the bed but had not yet been unpacked. A suit bag hung behind the door with her butler uniform. I got them out and tried on the jacket. It fitted perfectly. I think this side of things is going to be okay, I told Amanda. The butler outfit comprised a sleeveless, gray, pinstripe dress and a formal, black, single-button jacket. I rummaged through the suitcase. I know I should have felt ashamed to be riffling among a woman's intimate things, but circumstances demanded firm measures and I wanted to see whether I had access to everything I would need to carry off the impersonation. Agnes seemed to have packed all that I would need, apart from a wig and corset to trim my waist down a bit and provide a few curves. There will probably be a corset in the nursery, Amanda informed me, let's go and see. The old nursery was at the other end of the corridor. Inside it was an Aladdin's cave of discarded things. Old toys, broken furniture, piles of magazines, and, most important of all as far as I was concerned, rails of costumes and a chest of drawers which Amanda opened to reveal a selection of other garments including a couple of waist nippers. There should be some wigs in that box over there, if I remember right, Amanda said, pointing. I opened a cardboard box to discover three or four real hair wigs. I pulled out one that was a mid-brown and shoulder length. That is exactly the shade of your own hair, Amanda cried excitedly. It will be perfect. I gathered together the things we had selected and went back to Agnes' room. I'd better leave you to get changed, Amanda said, blushing slightly. That might be best. I grinned back. My butler's uniform from Agnes' suitcase I took bra, knickers and tights and, stripping off my male attire, started my transformation into Andrea. Fortunately Agnes seemed to have brought fairly substantial knickers with her, as I was able to tuck myself back between my legs, so that, with the knickers pulled up tight, I presented a smooth, feminine front. It was only as I slipped my arms through the bra straps that I remembered I didn't have anything to pat out the cups. Maybe there was something I could use back in the nursery. Once again I padded up the corridor. It was fortunate that the servant's floor was deserted as I only had my knickers and bra on. I went to where we had found the corset and pulled open a few more drawers. I couldn't believe my luck when I spotted two square boxes I thought looked familiar. On opening them I discovered I was right. There in my hands were two silicon breast forms. Clearly I'm not the first person to cross-dress in this house. I slipped the forms into the cups of my bra, they filled them perfectly. Back in Agnes's room I laced myself into the waist nipper and produced a slight but definite curve to my tummy. 
I guess I owe a debt of gratitude to the crossdresser who preceded me in this house and who kindly left his accessories behind. Next I carefully slid black tights up my legs. Sensibly Agnes had brought several pairs with her, but I couldn't afford to run a ladder this early. Taking Agnes's makeup kit into the bathroom, I set about transforming my face. Not too heavy makeup, I'm not trying to show off and attract attention. I need to blend into the background. Still a little foundation, blusher for contouring, a quick pluck to trim my eyebrows, mascara, and lipstick can work wonders in altering one's appearance. I stepped into the dress and, with a struggle, zipped it up the back. I knew from previous experience that I could fit into Agnes's shoes dash. I have particularly small feet for a man, so I slid into her sensible working shoe, knowing I could wear these all day with comfort. I couldn't help noticing that Agnes had also packed a couple of pairs of more frivolous footwear that might be fun to try on later. I then put on the wig and brushed out the odd tangle. My reflection in the mirror showed an attractive, professional woman. I think I might be able to pull this off. Only some simple jewelry required and I will be ready to appear in my new role. On opening Agnes's jewelry wrap, I discovered her earrings were only for pierced ears. Whilst I had had my ears pierced at college, over the intervening years the holes had healed over. I wondered whether my unknown benefactor might have left any jewelry in the nursery. I hurried back down the corridor. This time my heels made a reassuring clack on the linoleum. I was once again in luck. I quickly spotted a jewelry box amongst the costumes and picked out a pair of clip equals on faux pearl studs and a silver bracelet. On a whim, I slipped a ring onto my engagement finger. Slipping on my jacket, I took one last check in the mirror, took a deep breath, and set off downstairs. I was ready for my debut. Could I carry it off? My first port of call was with Lady Amanda. If she wasn't satisfied that I could carry off the impersonation, that I would have to come up with a plan B. I knocked on the drawing room door and waited until Lady Amanda called for me to enter. I bowed my head on entering. Will this be to your ladyship's satisfaction? I inquired. Amanda stood up and clapped her hands. My goodness you do know what you are doing, don't you? If I hadn't known you to be a man, I would never have guessed. I relaxed and smiled back at her. Well, it's been a long time, but in the old days I used to be mistaken for a real girl most of time. I lost count of the number of times my bottom got pinched in a nightclub. You and me both, Amanda grinned. You know, I actually think we might be able to carry this off. Knowing that there is a disguised man at my party will add an extra free zone, even if I'm the only one in on the secret. Well, if you are happy for me to go ahead, I had better go to the kitchen and make sure everything is on course for the weekend. The events of today are going to have put us back a bit, but I am confident my team can get us back on track. I won't detain you any longer, Amanda said, but please keep me informed as to progress. If you need to simplify any of the arrangements I agreed with Agnes, I'm sure we can sort something out between us. Of course, your ladyship, I replied, heading for the door. Oh, please call me Amanda, she cried out. I'd rather not, if you don't mind, I replied. As I am to be your butler for the weekend, it is best we start as we need to go on. It would arouse suspicions if we are too familiar with each other, and we don't want to give the game away, do we? Amanda agreed I was right, but clearly she would have preferred a more relaxed relationship with me. She wants to be part of the scheme herself so that she can enjoy putting one over on her friends. It was only as I was making my way to the kitchen that it struck me that none of my team know I am a crossdresser. Because for Agnes and me my switching gender is no big deal, I hadn't given any thought to how my staff might react. Everything had happened so quickly I hadn't had time to think through all the implications of my becoming Andrea for the weekend. I took a deep breath and stepped through the kitchen door with a show of confidence that I certainly didn't feel. Molly looked up from the table where she, Jean and Gemma were preparing cakes for the next day's afternoon tea, in anticipation of the arrival of Lady de Bruin's guests. Can I help you? she asked in a puzzled tone. Molly, it's me, Andrew, I told her. Look get Sally and Glenna in here and I will explain. When the whole team was gathered, I explained what was happening. 
Agnes is going to be okay and she is insistent that this event goes ahead. The only way we can make this work is if I become Andrea for the next few days. It won't be quite as odd as it might at first appear because I am an experienced crossdresser and this won't be the first time I spent time as a woman in public. Needless to say this announcement brought forth a flood of questions, which I answered as best I could. Eventually all five of my team seemed to accept the reality of what was happening even if they don't fully understand why I am willing to do this. Now Molly, you are going to have to step up into the chef role. Jean can be your number two, and I'll help out as and where you need me, I explained. I may not be as good a cook as either of you, but I can just about hold my own in the kitchen. Now, Lady de Bruin's guest will be arriving in the afternoon tomorrow. I am going to have to be on hand to open the door for them, but can help you prepare the afternoon tea during the morning. Now you said Agnes set off to pick up a few extra supplies. Is there anything you simply cannot do without? Molly assured me they would be able to cope with what they already had. By now it was getting on for 7 p.m. Right, ladies, I announced. I suggest we call it a day for now. Let's grab a quick supper and turn in. It is going to be all hands to the pumps for the next couple of days, so we had all better get our beauty sleep. You too, Mr. Andrew, or should I say Miss Andrea? Sally giggled. We all laughed, but she had, inadvertently, made a serious point. I has got to be Miss Andrea all the time until we finish this job, I told them, and, yes, I ought to sleep in femme, just in case something happens overnight and I have to appear in public in my nightdress. This produced more giggles from the girls. Just get it into your heads that for the next three days I am a woman, and treat me as such at all times. Of course, Miss Andrea, Molly replied. We do understand what you are saying and why this is important. We won't let you down. The others nodded in agreement. Jean rustled up a quick supper of scrambled eggs and smoked salmon, and then we all retired for the night. Back in my room I took Agnes's nightie and robe from the suitcase, cleaned off my makeup, and placed my wig on a stand next to my bedside where I can grab it if I need it quickly. Then I put on the nightdress and slipped into bed. I was pleased Agnes had packed a pretty, yet sensible nightie. I knew from my previous experience of sleeping with her that she often favored very sexy night sets, and was glad that on this occasion she hadn't brought one of those. The night passed peacefully without disturbance. My phone alarm went off at 6 o'clock a.m. I pulled on Agnes's dressing gown and made my way down the corridor to the bathroom shared by all the servants. I used the loo, remembering to sit in ladle-like fashion, and then enjoyed a hot shower. Back in the bedroom I put on my female underwear, makeup, and wig, and then climbed into a set of Agnes's kitchen whites. I made my way down to the kitchen and put the kettle on and made a pot of tea. Molly came down soon after and the other girls weren't far behind. We had our breakfast and started to get out the food we would need for afternoon tea and dinner that evening. At 7.30 I rang Lady Amanda and asked whether she would like us to prepare breakfast for her. She said she would and asked for soft-boiled eggs, toast, and tea. Jean put together a tray and I took it up to Lady Amanda's bedroom. Come in, she called, in response to my knock. I entered and placed the tray on a table in the window where Lady Amanda indicated. She was still in bed and wearing a nightdress a great deal less respectable than the one I had borrowed from Agnes. Amanda smiled as she noticed my trying to avert my gaze. Don't be embarrassed, she said. We are all girls here, aren't we? Well, yes, that is what we agreed, but... I stammered. Okay, if you are such a prude, please can you pass me my robe? I handed it over and breathed a sigh of relief as Amanda slipped it on, hiding most of her charms from my sight. Amanda slid her long, silky legs out of bed and padded across to the breakfast table. This is a real treat you know, she said as she cracked her first egg and I poured her a cup of tea. Everyone thinks that because I'm the daughter of a marquis I live in splendor all the time. But I'm the third child, and the second daughter. My brother Richard will inherit daddy's title and money. He works on the estate already. My sister Leonora and I have to look after our own affairs. Okay, daddy helped buy us flats in town, and we aren't exactly broke, but we both have proper jobs. 
I work for a small auction house, so to be served breakfast in bed is something that doesn't happen to me very often. I left Amanda enjoying her breakfast and returned to the kitchen. The six of us worked hard all morning. Molly, Jean and I in the kitchen, while Sally and Glenna laid up for tea in the parlor and set out the dining room for that evening's dinner. By 2 p.m. everything was ready. The afternoon tea was laid out and preparations well underway for dinner. Right, ladies, to your stations, I instructed. The guest will start arriving any time now, so let's get this show on the road. I hurried up to my room and changed into my butler uniform. Now our contract with Lady Amanda was to provide the catering for the weekend. There was no question of our delivering an Edwardian country house weekend because that would have required resources much greater that we could deliver. So my role was to look after the door and new arrivals, whilst Amanda greeted her friends and showed them to their rooms with the help of Mrs. Carpenter, the housekeeper. Once everyone had arrived, I would revert to being a kitchen hand until I was needed to oversee the serving of dinner. I was a bit nervous that my subterfuge might be discovered as soon as I started admitting the guests, but I got through that phase undetected. Everyone was so excited that the long-anticipated party was finally underway that they barely gave me a second glance. They simply saw what they expected to see, namely a female butler. I breathed a sigh of relief as Lady Amanda escorted the last guest upstairs. I quickly made my way up the back stairs to my room on the servant's floor. Here I changed back into my whites and, on returning to the kitchen, was instructed by Molly to start putting the salads together. Supper this evening was to be a buffet. Agnes and Molly had prepared some of the dishes in our base kitchen before driving to Broccoli Manor, but things like salads could only be prepared at the last minute. I was kept busy for the rest of the afternoon. As we took the last few dishes up to the dining room and set them out on the buffet, I was pleased at what we had achieved. There was cold turkey, a gammon joint, and a beautifully decorated poached salmon. These were flanked with a variety of salads, potatoes, and breads. Everything was served on the De Bruin silver and the candle-lit room sparkled. Sally and Glenna had done a really good job in laying the two, ten-seat tables. Amanda wanted an informal, chatty atmosphere, and so had the long formal dining table taken away. I checked the correct wines were ready, the reds breathing and the whites chilling in a marvelous antique basin. There was just time for me to get back upstairs and change into my butler uniform again before the time specified for pre-dinner drinks. This was going to be a more serious challenge for me, as I would now be interacting with the guests on a more personal level. I knew one of the biggest risks to being found out was my voice. Years ago, when I was dressing regularly, I had taken a few lessons with a speech coach to perfect a feminine way of speaking. I just had to hope my old skills hadn't deserted me. I had been practicing all afternoon and Molly and Jean had been kind enough to remark how much I sounded like a woman. Now was the moment to put it to the test. The ladies assembled in the library for their drinks. This evening was informal so dresses were casual rather than formal. There were still some fabulous frocks and trouser suits on display. A few of the supper outfits there was a real excited buzz among the guests as they assembled in the hall. Sally and Glenda asked each one what they would like to drink, I poured, and the two girls served. This way I didn't have to speak too much. However, I was put on my mettle when one rather butch woman marched up to the table where I was serving and demanded, in a strong American accent, say haven't you got any proper bourbon? I'm not too keen on the Scottish stuff, and I was actually serving a rather good malt whiskey. I asked the woman if she would excuse me for a moment as I didn't have a bourbon on the table. In fact I didn't know if Amanda would have a bottle of bourbon. We certainly hadn't packed any in our catering supplies. Fortunately Glenda remembered seeing a bottle in the library and was immediately sent to retrieve it. The American lady seemed satisfied and I even got half a smile and a grunted thank you dot. Sensibly Amanda delayed her entrance until all her guests were assembled and equipped with a drink. She then swept down the main staircase in her ravishing haute couture cocktail dress. She looked fabulous! Amanda's dress for the first evening of her party at 7 p.m. precisely, I struck the gong to announce dinner was now ready to be served. 
As the lady guests made their way leisurely to the dining room, I hurried round through a service passage to join Glenna and Sally and help serve the different dishes. Once all the guests had been served and had wine in their glass, I placed more bottles of wine on each table and the three of us retired, leaving the party to their own enjoyments. From the hubbub, it sounded as though it was going to be a vivacious evening. Back in the servants' side of the house, things weren't yet over for us. We had to clear the drinks debris from the library and lay up for breakfast in the conservatory. Only then could we sit down for our own supper, which comprised offcuts from that being enjoyed in the dining room. Then it was off to bed and a well-earned rest. Saturday was an early start for us in the kitchen. We had twenty breakfasts to prepare and, of course, each lady wanted something slightly different. Some of the guests were quite late coming downstairs and several looked a little fragile. Clearly the previous evening had been a good one. Lady Amanda had arranged a spa day for her friends at a nearby country club. So, after breakfast, the party departed for their day of pampering. This was a relief to my teen and me as it meant we could concentrate on that evening's dinner without interruption. Agnes had certainly left us with a task. Her menu involved a lot of elaborate dishes. Fortunately Molly rose to the challenge. She soon had Jean and I assembling ingredients for the different dishes and, once this was done set us to preparing various sauces. Gemma was kept busy helping Molly, whilst Glenna and Sally were roped in to help with vegetable bashing. We were all busy, but it was a happy atmosphere as we all pulled together to ensure Agnes's vision was realized. I was delighted by the way the others treated me not as the boss, but simply as one of the girls. Certainly the conversation made no allowance for my manly sensibilities. Initially I kept quiet, but little by little was drawn into the conversation. It was amusing and revealing to hear how frankly the women shared their love lives and sexual experiences. And what about you Andrea, what's your experience of men been like? Jean inquired. I hedged around, trying to avoid making a direct reply, but the others spotted my evasion straight away and were having none of it. Come on. If you are going to be a woman, you have to behave as one. You see how we share. It's now your turn, Molly said in a firm tone. I couldn't really argue with that. Well, actually, I haven't had that much experience with men, I confessed. Although I cross-dress and have been out with Agnes to clubs and the like in Andrea mode, I'm actually straight. I like women. Ooh, a closet lesbian, Gemma giggled. I suppose you could say that describes me rather well, I reposted, with a smile. Sometimes when I was out en femme I'd be hit on by a man, and I often got my bottom pinched in a crowded club, but as I was mostly with Agnes, we were able to play up and pretend we were a lesbian couple. Oh, we all know about wandering hands, said Sally, dismissively. It is something all girls have to learn how to handle. But have you never been tempted to go with a bloke? This was getting very personal, but the other girls hadn't held back in describing their circumstances. And it was a bit too late to pull the boss trick. Well yes, once or twice, early on, but I managed, in the main to limit their interest to snogging and deep petting. I have given a few blowjobs, and slept with one guy. However, I was well smashed on that occasion and, to be honest, can't remember much about it. I do recall my arse was as sore as hell in the morning. By now everyone was laughing and giggling and I found myself joining in. But the fact is I soon found I still preferred girls, so I guess you are right in saying that when dressed I am a lesbian. Have you ever slept with Agnes? Jean asked, slyly. Sorry, that is a question too far, I replied. I don't mind sharing my experiences in general, but I'm not a kiss and tell girl. Sorry, Jean apologized, somewhat abashed. And so you should be my girl, Molly upbraided her. What Miss Agnes and Miss Andrea get up to in their own time is no concern of ours. Well, at least she was still referring to us as two women and not two employers. The atmosphere cooled for a while after this, but good spirits soon resumed and the day passed quickly as we got everything ready for the evening feast. I have to admit I felt really proud of my team as I viewed the dining room, with the silver gleaming and the crystal sparking. I was also sure that the food we had labored to prepare was as good as might be served in a top-class restaurant. I hoped Lady Amanda would be pleased. 
Lady Amanda and her friends returned from the spa in a very happy, giggly mood. Clearly alcohol had been consumed in some quantity. The fact that a couple of the guests were clutching champagne bottles was a bit of a giveaway. The women made their way up to their bedrooms to get changed for dinner as I prepared the library for pre-dinner drinks. Lady Amanda came in and walked across to me. How is it going from your point of view, Andrea? She asked. For my part it seems everything is going swimmingly. All my friends have praised the food, and no one has indicated they have noticed anything out of the ordinary about you. To the contrary, Fiona and Sylvia have said you are the best butler they have ever encountered. I thanked her and said, so long as you are happy, that is what we are all striving to achieve. You are sweet, Amanda said, and, to my great surprise, leaned forward and kissed me on the cheek. Blushing, she turned and hurried to the door. Sorry, I shouldn't have done that, I heard her mutter as she left the room. I was gobsmacked. I have to confess that I find Lady Amanda very attractive, but she is my client and, as it happens, a lesbian, so I wouldn't have anticipated anything like that kiss. I felt confused. But duty called. I finished preparing drinks and waited for the guests to descend. As they gradually assembled I awaited Amanda's entrance with great anticipation. I wasn't disappointed. As she swept down the stairs, I caught my breath at the sight of her stunning beauty. Tonight she was wearing a deceptively simple-looking, pale blue, off-the-shoulder gown, with her blonde hair down and dressed over her right shoulder. She looked stunning. I couldn't help it, my heart gave a leap. Stop it. She's not only a client and a lesbian, but she is also a member of the aristocracy. Her daddy is a marquis. As on the previous evening, I served guests their pre-dinner drinks. This time I made sure I had a bottle of bourbon ready for the butch American. Just as well, as she swept down on me with a glint in her eye. Without speaking, I smiled and handed her a glass of bourbon. She took it and turned away. Then, somewhat to my surprise, she turned and gave me a very hard stare. I wondered what I might inadvertently have done to upset her this time. But, before I could say anything, she turned away and rejoined a group of her friends. I noticed that as they talked some of the others looked my way. At precisely the time Lady Amanda had specified, I announced, dinner is served. The party progressed to the dining room where the first course a seafood platter was already on the table. Once everyone was seated I went round the table pouring rather splendid Chablis. As I served the American I received another glare from her. Clearly, I have done something to upset her, even if I have no idea what that might be. Once the first course was underway, Glenna, Sally and I returned to the kitchen to get ready to serve the entree. This was a chicken dish served with a delicious sauce of Agnes's own devising. It is one of the company's signature dishes. When we had cleared the first course, the three of U.S. took in the chicken. As I placed the plate in front of the American, she suddenly grabbed my wrist in one hand and with the other tore off my wig. There, I knew there was something wrong with this butler, she snarled. It's a man! A gasp arose from the other guests. What are you doing here, boy? The American continued. This is an all-woman event. Men are strictly forbidden. There was a moment of stunned silence, broken by a white-faced Amanda rising and saying, in a loud voice, Stop it, Kate. Andrea is here with my full knowledge and approval. If it hadn't been for her stepping into the breach at the last moment, my party would have had to be cancelled. I noticed Amanda was referring to me as she dot. But it's a man, Kate reposted. The whole point of this weekend was that it is just for us girls who prefer women to men. Yes, I know. Amanda replied, and Andrea is as much a woman as you are. She enjoys the finer aspects of female fashion even if you don't. This jibe clearly hit home, and I could see Kate was winding herself for another diatribe. Fortunately, at this point one of the other guests interjected. Let's calm down for a moment and give Amanda time to explain. Amanda then went through the saga of Agnes's accident and how I volunteered to take her place. Andrea bravely revealed that she is a cross-dresser, Amanda told her friends, who by now were engrossed in her story. In this day and age gender isn't that clear-cut as we all know. 
In my opinion, as a crossdresser Andrea has every right to be considered a woman and therefore it is quite appropriate that she be here helping make this weekend a success. I agree, one of the other guests interjected. I'm sure we can all agree that Andrea and her team are doing a splendid job. Now let them get on with their work so that we can enjoy this wonderful dish before it gets cold. I have to confess to feeling shattered. I was very appreciative of the way Lady Amanda had spoken up on my behalf, but I had come close to ruining her party. So, once I had finished helping serve the main course and we were back in the kitchen, I said to Sally and Glenna, can you two manage on your own for the rest of the meal? It would probably be best if I kept out of the way. That was so unfair, Sally said angrily. I was in two minds whether to accidentally spill the sauce boat all over that Kate woman. This lightened the atmosphere and we all laughed. Just as well you didn't, I said, even so I think I had better lie low for the rest of the evening. I spent the rest of the evening helping Molly and Jean deal with the dirty dishes and glasses returning from the dining room. Glenna and Sally did brilliantly serving the remainder of the meal without me and, once coffee, chocolates and liqueurs had been put on the table, the five of us had a well-earned drink. I'm feeling wiped out, I confessed. That outburst has affected me more than I thought it would. Do you mind if I clear off to bed and leave you to finish off? Of course not. Off you go, Molly, told me. It won't seem so bad in the morning. I wasn't so sure, but I went upstairs anyway and, changing into my nightie, slipped into bed. Needless to say I couldn't get to sleep. My brain kept rerunning the scene in the dining room. I so hoped I hadn't ruined Lady Amanda's birthday party. Eventually, maybe a couple of hours later, I was finally starting to drift off when there was a gentle knock on my door. I sat up in bed, thinking it must be one of my team with a problem. What is it? Come in, I called. The door opened and, to my surprise, Lady Amanda walked in. She was still wearing her evening gown so I guessed she had come straight to my room after the party downstairs had broken up. Embarrassed I sat up in bed trying to pull the bedclothes up to cover me with one hand whilst grabbing my wig off its stand with the other. There was no way I could put my wig on one-handed and, inevitably I had to let go of the bedclothes. Nice nighty, Amanda grinned. I hope you don't mind my popping in, but I just wanted to apologize for the unforgivable behavior of one of my guests. My other friends have given her a good talking to I can assure you. Of course not my lady, I replied, but honestly it wasn't necessary. I was very touched by your defense of me in the dining room. Oh please, drop the my lady, Amanda groaned. The cat is out of the bag now, so there is no point in pretending I wasn't aware of the deception. In a way, I'm sorry the trick is over. I've loved the free zone of seeing you working around the house in your female uniform, knowing that underneath your skirt you were wearing a living, breathing dildo. I could resist. We both burst out laughing. I really did appreciate your vocal support, I told Amanda. Your friend Kate has been off with me all weekend, so she probably had her suspicions all along. That doesn't excuse her behavior, Amanda said firmly but she has always been big misogynist. Although I and many of my friends are either lesbians or bisexual, that doesn't mean we don't enjoy some male friendships. And she looked away, blushing. I'd better go, Amanda said, hurriedly, opening the door. Don't worry about tomorrow morning, everything will be fine. Good night. Good night your ladyship, sorry I mean Amanda, I added hurriedly as she turned her head toward me with a frown. A warm smile lit up her beautiful face. Very much better, Andrea. See you in the morning. And she left, closing the door quietly behind her. This incident did nothing to help me fall asleep and I tossed and turned for a long time, my brain racing, until I finally dropped off. The following morning, Sunday, I had to force myself out of bed. I was worried about the reaction I might get from the guests after last evening's fiasco. However, most of the guests would be departing soon after breakfast and our work would then be done. So it was with some trepidation that I donned my butler's uniform for the last time and made my way to the kitchen. The rest of my team were already hard at work preparing breakfast, and I apologized for my tardy appearance. Don't say another word, Molly scolded me. 
You have done more than your fair share this weekend, and that is before taking account of the strain it has been taking over from Miss Agnes at such short notice. We all agreed to let you have a bit of a lie-in. But now you're here, could you take the fresh fruit and juices through to the dining room? Of course I did as she requested. On the way I bumped into two of the guests returning from an early morning stroll around the garden. They stopped and spoke to me. Andrea, we just want to let you know that the majority of us are most appreciative of all you have done to make this weekend a success. Amanda explained more about what you have been through when we were sitting over coffee. One or two girls share Kate's view, but for our part, we think you are a lovely woman. And she leaned forward and kissed me on both cheeks. Naturally, I thanked them profusely. Breakfast will be ready in half an hour, I told them, as a way to overcome my embarrassment. Their support was lovely and quite out of the blue. I wasn't sure how to react. Fortunately, the two women just smiled and continued upstairs to their rooms. I was in two minds whether to participate in serving breakfast. But, taking heart from this conversation, I just took a deep breath as I entered the dining room with a tray of bacon and sausages. One woman looked up from her coffee and called out, Good morning, Andrea. You must tell me where you source your coffee. This blend is delicious. That lifted my spirits, so I could cope with the glower Kate gave me as she entered the room. Fortunately, breakfast was self-service from heated salvers, so I was required to stay in the room for long. Once breakfast was finished, the guests started to bring down their luggage and make their farewells to Amanda. Molly, Jean, Gemma, Sally, Glenna and I finished putting all our things in the van, which was parked just outside the kitchen door. Once it was loaded I suggested Molly and the others should set off back to London. It will be a bit of a squeeze, but if you can all manage to get in the van, I'll pop into the hospital and see how Agnes is getting on, I told them. I saw the van away and was heading up to my room to get my or rather Agnes's things when I heard my name being called. It was Amanda, who had come into the servant's corridor. Andrea, can you hang on for a moment, she called. I turned and came back downstairs. Of course, my lady, I said. We have just finished up here and I was coming to see you before I depart to ask whether everything has been to your satisfaction and apologize if my deception has caused any friction between you and some of your friends. Amanda laughed. The weekend has been wonderful, and you and your team have been splendid. As for Kate and her outburst, don't give it another thought. She will sulk for a few days, but then she'll come back round. You see Kate is a dreadful snob and just loves meeting the sort of people I can introduce her to. I'm pleased my lady, I would have hated to inadvertently put a dampener on your birthday celebrations. Well you haven't, Amanda reposted. And will you stop that my lady thing once and for all? I thought we sorted that out last night. I blushed. I'm sorry. I said, it is just that most of our aristocratic customers expect maximum deference. I've already explained that just because daddy is a marquee, that doesn't stop me having to be a working girl, just like you, Amanda replied crossly. I smiled at the feminine reference to my being a working girl. Dot. Now if you don't have to rush away immediately, change into something less formal and let's a relaxing drink in the library together. I'd love to, I replied, but I don't think Agnes packed anything other than work clothes. Oh, I'm sure you can find something pretty in the dressing up room, Amanda replied, with an offhand gesture. I grinned back at her. Actually that would be very nice, I told Amanda. Right, you go and get changed and I'll open us a nice bottle of wine. See you in the drawing room. I hurried upstairs and made my way to the old nursery. Rummaging among the rack of female clothing I found a lovely dress. What's more it was my size. I also picked up a pair of high heels. I quickly changed, applied a fresh coat of lipstick, ran a brush through my hair, and returned downstairs. Amanda was sitting in the drawing room with two glasses of chilled white wine in front of her. Come and sit beside me, she said, patting the sofa on which she was sitting. I did as she requested. I see you have found a lovely frock, she said admiringly. Now, cheers. Here's to a lovely weekend. We chinked glasses and I took a grateful sip of my drink. Now that I had mentally come off duty, I realized just how drained I felt. 
Amanda started asking me about my business and showed great interest as I explained how Agnes and I had built it up from scratch. You know, she said, thoughtfully, there's a really interesting article to be written about your business. I have a journalist chum who I think would be very interested in meeting you. Now I know how big an impact a positive press article can have on a business such as ours, so my ears pricked up. That would be fantastic, I told Amanda. Would you really set up an introduction? Amanda blushed. I'll do whatever it takes to see you again, she confessed in a small voice, avoiding looking me in the eye. As I may have indicated already, I'm more bisexual than lesbian, and I find your duality more than a bit of a turn-on. Now it was my turn to blush. Amanda broke the embarrassed silence. No need to say anything now. Just promise you will come and see me in town. How would next Thursday evening be? Here is my address, and she passed me her card. Words were tumbling out of her whilst I found it difficult to say anything. In the end I managed to get out, Thursday would be fine. And I would very much like to see you again. I think you are one of the loveliest women I have ever met. Only one of the loveliest? Amanda pouted, teasingly. Stop it, I retorted taking her hands. You know exactly what I mean. And then words were superfluous as we kissed. I want to drag you up to bed right now, Amanda confessed, but I think we both need to calm down a bit, don't you? I agreed. I had no desire to risk spoiling a potential long-term relationship with Amanda by ripping her knickers off at the first moment we acknowledge our mutual attraction. We recovered our composure and drew apart. So, I'll see you Thursday, Amanda said with a shy smile. Give a ring during the week and we can sort out a time. Come for supper. Oh, and come as Andrew, I want to get to know him as well as Andrea. But bring a change of clothes just in case. We both burst out laughing and kissed again. Well I had better put this dress away and change to go and see Agnes in the hospital, I said ruefully. Oh keep the dress on, Amanda replied with a dismissive wave of her hand. It really suits you. You won't shock Agnes by turning up at the hospital as a woman, and the nursing staff won't give you a second glance. So that is what I did. Having made a fairly lengthy farewell to Amanda and reassured her several times that, yes, I will come to see you on Thursday, I got into my car and drove to the hospital. Amanda was quite right. I walked into the ward with no problem at all. The nurse on the desk looked up as I entered. I explained I had come to see Agnes and she directed me to the correct bed. Agnes's eyebrows rose as I approached her bedside. Well, I think from your appearance, I can assume the weekend went well, she said, smiling. I leant over and kissed her. Better than you can possibly imagine, I whispered. Naturally Agnes wanted to know everything about how we had got on. She squealed with delight when I told her that Amanda and I were attracted to each other. Just what you need, Agnes said, a woman who knows about and is happy with Andrea. You seem to have fallen on your feet. Maybe it is just as well I had this accident. This was too much and I told her to stop being silly and concentrate on getting better. The doctors say they will be able to move me to a hospital nearer home some time this week, she told me, so that will make it easier for you to come and see me and tell me about what you get up to. You know I'm not a kiss and tell girl, I replied with a grin as I rose to leave. Let me know when you get transferred and I'll pop in, I said, leaning to kiss her. Don't forget your purse, Agnes reminded me wickedly as I turned away leaving it on her bed. You are going to have to practice at being a woman again. It's been so long since you dressed that you have forgotten some of the routines. I'm sure you won't let me mess up, I replied with a grin, and left the ward. Driving home I kicked off my heels and settled back in my stocking feet. I felt relaxed and comfortable. Agnes was right. I had kept Andrea in the closet for far too long. Now she is out I can't see her going back in any time soon.